Listen to me. I know if you are watching this, you have friends. <laughs> I don't know how many you have, or I don't even know how you define friendship, but whether you call them friends or not, whether you've got few or many, you've got friends. I want to ask you another question, and that's what I want to discuss in this video. The question is, are your friends sober? Stay tuned so we can talk about it. Friends, how many of us have them? You probably got to be like 45. No, I'm not 45, but at least 40 and over to, to, to know what I mean there. But, yo, I think this is one of the most when I look back over my life, when I look back over my life, this is probably one of the greatest contributors to my development and my well-being. And when I look through throughout scripture, I feel like it is probably one of the most underemphasized concepts in all of the Bible. You know, it's, it's the weirdest thing because most of us are spending uh, our lives engaging with, interacting with people we would call friends. I'm, I'm inclined to say this. I'm inclined to say, this, at least this is my experience. This might be not, not be your experience. I don't know, let's argue about it in the comments. I don't mind a good argument as long as it's respectful. <laughs> it's okay if we disagree. Um, but I believe relational richness is one of the highest forms of riches. I think spiritual richness is the highest form of rich. So if you're spiritually poor, that's the worst kind of poverty. Because um, when when your spirit, your spirituality is the only important thing in your life, but it affects everything else that's important. So when you spiritually poor, nothing else is as rich as it could be. Got me. So spiritual richness is the most important. Emotional richness is the second most important. This is why I think people need to have emotional goals. I think I need to do a video on that. What do you think? Put it in the comments if you want me to do a video on emotional goals. It's weird because like I just did this training not too long ago with my mentor and coaching group called Daniel's Day and we did what's called a finish strong plan. And so we kind of mapped out a strategy to be intentional about advancing in a few key areas for the last quarter of the year or whatever. And one of the goals that I made them put on the goal sheet we created was emotional goals. Like people have financial goals, they have all sorts of goals. They don't have emotional goals. I think you should have goals for your emotions. How do you want to feel? What is the dominant most dominant emotion that you want to <clears throat> that you want to feel? Because how you are emotionally, generally speaking, is how you are. But then there's relational riches, which is to me one of the highest forms of riches. It's the top three, and that is the 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 value that is added to your life based off of the relationships that you have. The treasure is in earthen vessels. So your relational richness affects your emotional richness and your spiritual richness. So relationships, man, are super important. And I think a lot of the conversation, specifically in churches, the conversation about relationships is about like romantic relationships. It's the weirdest thing to me. Like most of the time we're like in church, we're talking about like marriage. And it's like, you know, most of the people aren't married. Like if I'm teaching the average church, like most of the people in society aren't married. So in some ways, some of the, some of the dynamics we see in society, we see reflected in the church, right? So people are taking longer to get married and because of divorce rates, it's just the majority of people aren't married. So anyway, that's another conversation for another. Put it in the comments if you want me to talk about that. too. <laughs> but um. The point that I'm making is like there's a lot of emphasis on romantic relationships when what the Bible speaks about more than romantic relationships is platonic relationships. As a matter of fact, the famous scripture, don't be unequally yoked, applies to romantic relationships. But when you read it, guys, Paul wasn't even talking <laughs> about romantic relationships. He was talking about platonic relationships. And the Bible talks way more about that than romantic relationships. And it's not that romantic relationships aren't important because some of you probably don't put it in the comments. The first relationship was Adam and Eve. My God. All right. You win. You, <laughs> you win. The point that I'm making is, though, the Bible talks about relationships and specifically in the Old Testament, it talk, talks a lot about this concept of friendship. And you really see a concentrated conversation on friendship in the book of Proverbs. So if you want to proof 
if you want to like fact check me on some of this, look in Proverbs and you'll see more conversations explicitly about friendship in that book than any other book. So the question is this, why is God talking so much about it? He doesn't emphasize something that's not important. So if God is emphasizing it, it means it's important. And just because I'm not aware of the importance of a thing or how important a thing is, doesn't mean it's not important. I think sometimes we are not experiencing God's best in our life because we are unaware of what's important. Think about that. Like I recently started this series at our church called, um, it's called God Didn't Say That. I actually been waiting to do this and researching and preparing for this for a couple of years now. And one of the things that I kind of talk about is how that, um, that very often we are attempting to do what we think God said. So our intentions are right because we're trying to execute what we think God wants. But very often there's a gap between what we think God wants and what God actually wants. What's what we think is important to him and what is actually important to him. And so here, here's a point that I'm making is like our relationships are super important to him. We are, whether we are aware of it or not, we are impacted positively or negatively by our relational circle. I, wa I want us to get this fam, please listen to me. There is no such thing as a neutral relationship. It doesn't exist. There is no such thing as a neutral relationship. What does that mean? It means every relationship, even if I'm unaware of it, even if the impact is minuscule, minuscule and minimum, every relationship in some way is either positively affecting me or negatively affecting me. I'm going to say it again. Every relationship is either, listen to me, pushing me toward the highest version of myself or pushing me toward the lowest version of myself. You know, there's this saying, to thine own self be true. I think it depends on which self you're talking about. <laughs> right? <laughs> to, your own, to your own self be true, not to my lower self. My lower self is a mess. Here's the word the Bible used to describe my lower self. It's called the flesh, like walking according to the flesh. And that's not just lust, that's just like lower self appetites and desires and things of that particular nature. What up, real quick, give me a second question for you. Do you want more peace? Do you wanna be more productive? Do you want more purpose in your life? Do you wanna be more profitable? If so, I can help you. I've got a mentoring and coaching group called Daniel's Den. I want you to go to danielsden.com, find out more. I'll see you in the den. To thine own self be true. It it depends. It depends. Are you gonna be true to the highest version of yourself? And I think this this is really key and critical, like when it comes to relationships. So the question is, not just do I have people in my life, not just do I have friends, are they sober? And when I say sober, I'm not talking about intoxication with alcohol, because that's not the only form of intoxication. We could be intoxicated with emotions, right? We can be intoxicated with ambition. We can be intoxicated with jealousy. We can be intoxicated. We can be intoxicated with a number of different emotions that influence us to behave in ways that are not in our best interest or in the best interest of others. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves is this, do I have people around me that are actually sober? It's not whether or not the people around me have emotions. Everybody has emotions. The question is, do my emotions have me or do their emotions have them? And that's a key and critical question, family. It's an important question. Um, and, and here's why. Here's why. <laughs> here's the way friendship is supposed to work. Listen to me. The Bible says there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. That's Proverbs, guys. So it's not just, is Jesus that? Yes, but is, is that a prophetic proverb pointing exclusively to Jesus? No, that's a truism. That's an axiom that Solomon's articulated. He's just saying that, that when friends function the way God intended for friends to function, friends become like family without the last name. And that if a friend is functioning the way God intends for a friend to function, I want you to catch this, that friend 
sometimes will be a person that you're closer to than your brother. Just because you're kin doesn't mean you're close. It's not kinship that determines closeness, it's character. There's some people in your family you're closer to than others. You, I mean, you can. It's like you got, let's say you got four cousins. You might, come on now, come on. You love one. You kind of like, if you see the other three, you like, <laughs> come on. You got family you don't even know. You, right? Sometimes you go to family reunion, somebody walk up to you, baby, I remember you. They kiss you, they leave. You look at mama and say, who is that? That's your Aunt Barbara. You don't remember? No. I don't, I don't remember. You used to come over to my house, I used to cook for you. I don't remember. <laughs> so, so here's the point. The point is this. I think sometimes um, th there's a show on Netflix, I think it's called Love is Blind. I think it's the name of it. Yes. Sometimes there's a love that blinds us to the intoxication of those that are around us. And what ends up happening is this. We become surrounded by people that are intoxicated with some of them insecurity, some of them jealousy, some of them competitiveness, some of them combativeness. And we can end up being in unhealthy and sometimes even emotionally abusive friendships because we fail to realize and recognize that this person around me, they may love me deeply, but they're intoxicated with something that's stopping them from loving me well. People can love you strong and love you wrong if they hadn't addressed what's wrong with them. And I want you to think about this because I don't want you to get to a season where you're so disappointed and hurt. Where the person you think will be celebrating your elevation goes silent. See, I, I don't even have time to deal with that because A lot of people's insecurity regarding your elevation is not going to be exposed in what they say negatively. It's going to be exposed in what they don't say at all. It's the silence. That's an indication that they're not sober. Do you take their silence as, oh, uh, they maybe not really heavy for you? I know it's a great question. That's a great question. So, no, I feel like, yeah, so every time there's silence, it doesn't mean somebody's not supportive. I think you know as a person, what someone else's temperament and personality is and what their love language is in terms of the way that they express love and support. I think that is completely different than someone who is typically vocal, right? And then when you start winning, the vocal goes silent. That's something completely different than someone just being true to who they are and maybe they show up in a number of different ways. I just think the, I brought that up because I feel like a lot of people miss that. And so when I, whether, whether I'm ministering to people or coaching people who are dealing with some kind of relational tension a lot of times they're so they're so surprised because they didn't see the shift coming uh and um the truth of the matter is you know it doesn't mean it's a bad person it's just like your good season can trigger bad feelings in a good person and it makes it difficult for them to for them to handle it doesn't mean they're bad people i'm not saying you need to eliminate them completely out of your life but to be surprised by the inevitable is to be naive and my prayer for your life my life, too, is that God will keep surrounding us with sober friends. Take care.